Robin. I guess we do have a quorum. So, shall we begin? I can, I can begin with, uh, whoops. Okay, um, so I'll just begin by calling the meeting to order at 6.04 p.m. Um, on July 22nd, 2020. And um, so uh, repeat the preamble we've done at our uh, Zoom-based meetings based on Governor Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law signed uh, Thursday, March 12th, 2020. This meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. Uh, I'm Jane Wald uh, and as chair of the Amherst Historical Commission, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.04 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and minutes are being taken as usual. So now I'll take a roll call uh, to establish a quorum of commission members. As you hear your name called, uh, unmute yourself if you're muted, answer affirmatively, and then please place yourselves back on mute. So Patricia Hall. Present. Robin Fordham. Not present, at least not yet. Uh, Janet Marquardt. Present. Jane Scheffler. Here. Hetty Startup. Present. Jane Wald, I'm present too. Uh, so during the meeting, um, as we go through the agenda, please raise, use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment and I'll keep my eye out for uh, the raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. So first on our agenda is um, announcements. Um, I have a uh, question about uh, minutes of the June 24th meeting. Are we waiting on a final version of that? Or are we all set with that? Uh, so we are all set. I was not able to find um, the vote count that Jan had um, had pointed out was missing, um, and so I emailed the version just without that in it to Nate. Um, and then at some point, if I can figure out how to get access to the old the old meetings on YouTube or wherever they are, I'll go back and, and get that put in. Okay, thank you, Jane. And then we'll just we'll. Uh, take up the minutes at the next meeting. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we can do that. And I will say that the YouTube channel, interestingly enough, I can't watch it on um, my Chrome, Chrome and my Chrome browser. It, it always airs out, but I have to, if I'm in Safari on a Mac, it works. So I haven't figured out why it doesn't work in some, you know, in one uh, web browser or the other, but I had a lot of difficulty playing back those videos in a uh -huh. Chrome. Yeah, I might be able to help with that if. Uh... If someone just wants to shoot me an email, I, I know where the videos are and I can find that. And just to let you know, there's three uh, members in attendance. And so, um, you know, just let everyone know this is a webinar. And so attendee, uh, the commission are panelists. And so they can see each other and speak freely and members of the public in attendance, you could click raise your hand if you have a question and uh, we can call on you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other announcements? Okay, uh, next is a discussion of the demolition bylaw and the July 7th workshop with Chris Skelly of the Massachusetts Historical Commission. Um, Nate, you sent out uh, a number of attachments and uh, some points that you thought were that should particularly be discussed. Would you like to introduce those? Yeah, Jay, I just want to say that um, Anika is here and she, you know, speaks on behalf of the Civil War tablet. So I don't know if we want to go out of order um, just so if this becomes a longer discussion before we jump into it. If we want to um, have a discussion of Civil War tablets before the demolition. Um, um, I think that? the discussion of the demolition bylaw will probably be lengthy. So um, why don't we right. go to an update 
and discussion of the Civil War tablets. Sure. Anika, I'm promoting you to panelists so you can just, you'll be able to see everyone. So I didn't want to throw a wrench in the order there. I just wanted to not have her sit on a yeah. hour. Sure. Okay. Hi, Anika. Nice, nice to have you back. You can unmute yourself. Yep. Hi there. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Nice to see you again. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. Um, Thank you. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, an update on a site visit. Uh, ben, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, basically, um, I based off the our, our discussion last meeting um, and in talks with Nate. Um, we kind of figured the a logical next step would just be to go um, see the tablets at the um, they're at the DPW site on, in North Amherst, and so uh, basically, I'm just trying to find a date um, that works. Uh, well, one the purpose I'm trying to see one who who from the historical commission would like to come. Um, I'm also trying to coordinate with the uh, restoration consultants that we worked with um to see if they would like to join as well and you know maybe they would be the limiting factor for when they happen to be in western mass um, or if they're willing to drive up here from connecticut so um i've been in touch with the uh, dpw superintendent Gil guilford and um as far as we know if we just want to see like the <laughs> the topmost tablet the one that's the most accessible it's fairly straightforward um to just open up that that one uh box to see the one tablet but if we wanted to see all the tablets and kind of lay them out nicely and you know and, and look at each one it would be more involved of a process because you know we'd probably need a forklift um it would involve handling the tablets quite a bit and um you know and then having to close them all back up and put them back in storage so um as of now we're leaning towards just looking at one one tablet the one that's the most accessible but i think that's still um open for discussion so that's pretty much as far as it's gotten at this point um i haven't heard back from the restoration consultants yet about a date that they might happen to be here um so i'm just kind of waiting to hear from a few different folks at this point yeah i mean i think for the commission it is you know it'd be great you know I think we'll have to stagger the site visit if you know if a lot of people want to attend. So I think that's you know fine if um, a lot of commission members want to attend. And yeah. Anika, if you and your team want to attend, I mentioned in an email we could stagger times. I think a big, a big part of the discussion is you know do we would we like to see all the tablets or just the top you know the top one? Essentially, they're you know in these crates that are leaning you know stacked up um, you know deep you know so many deep and so. DPW indicated they could move them all around. It is a little bit more work. So I think that's something to discuss. I mean, do we want to get them all out and, and visible or is it okay just to see the top one to see, you know, is that representative of the rest? I see uh, Jan's hand and then Sam and then Eddie. Yeah, I can't figure out how to do the hand up on the, <laughs> this, um, this point, so I'm just using my hands. Um, how, do we have a condition report on them written out before they were put into storage that we you can know, look at. The consultant's cleaning report, you know, so is a, a conditions report. Okay, and then how are, what kind of crates are they in? Do we know that they've been completely protected or is there a chance of them being damaged? Marble is incredibly delicate, you know. What? Yeah. Um, I'm going to try to just pull up the report. Uh, the they were in. This was meant to be you know temporary storage. So the consultants created you know wooden frames that they were in that were hinged, mm. and so they had a backing, and then they placed the crates in those, and then they put foam insulation around them, and then you know they closed the front of those, and probably they're they're attached you know maybe by screws, and so they're secure in their crates, but they're not you know, a while ago when we were thinking about bringing them to town hall, the consultant said, if we wanted to move them, you know, hire a rigging company and, 
you know, maybe the thought would be they'd have to be, the crates would have to be reinforced. So, you know, they're fine if they're not moved around a lot, but, you know, I don't think that the crates were meant to be, you know, something that they're in long term or to be transported in. Yeah, I wouldn't move them for us if we didn't have to. I think every time you move them, there's a possibility of damage. Mm -hmm. And I'd be curious to know what kind of wood, if it was just like pine or poplar, or if they use something like oak, like art handling materials. Right. You know. But if we have a if we have a complete description when they clean them and we haven't moved them and they aren't sitting on top of each other, the bottom one might have gotten crushed. I think we can pretty well assume that reading that and seeing one would be enough. Right. Ben, did you have a comment? No. Okay. Um, Hetty and then Anika, I thought I saw your hand up also. But um, Hetty, why don't you make your comment and then let invite Anika. Uh, I think my only question, um, Jane, would be, is there any kind of photographic documentation that exists for each panel so that we could be satisfied by seeing one on top that the others would be sort of available as photographic records for now? I, I like um, uh, Jan, I'm concerned about just how um, fragile they might be and also how extensive uh, an undertaking it would be to have a forklift truck come in as well. Sure, so I'm trying to oh. share the, the, you know, the, the cleaning report and it doesn't get into how they were created. I have a picture of that, but so, you know, this is the cleaning and um, so, you know, these are, these are the photographs of them after restoration. And so, you know, this to me is what, you know, what the crate would look like, the picture on the right. So they had, you know, they put foam above it and around it, and then they enclosed it with, it looks just like, you know, two by fours and some, you know, it wasn't, like I said, it was only meant to be a temporary storage. So, you know, these were the, the setup for the restoration and you can see what the crating looks like. So it wasn't, wasn't you know meant to be like I said a, a serious structure around them? All right, that's good to know. Um, Anika, did you have a comment? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yes. Well, um, I agree with everything that's uh, been brought up so far. Um, another something positive in regards to just seeing even one uh, tablet would be that we would know whether there was any permanent color transfer from that foam mm -hmm. um, had, had this bled into the tablets and hopefully be able to determine if as brought up if they are stacked heavily on top you know is there any evidence to suggest that something on the bottom may have been cracked we could probably an overall general idea of condition mm -hmm. okay. Do we have, have photos of, of every tablet or just what's part of this report? Just what is part of this report. So, you know, there wasn't, um, you know, I think they have every tablet, but it wasn't, you know, in necessarily in order or done, you know, so that you could say this is, you know, this is the sequence of tablets as they were originally displayed. But we could probably presume that they're all in this kind of, um, state that that if there was uh, d destruction or there were issues with any one of the tablets, one would assume that the um, conservation company would have would have photographed it and let us know. Right. I mean, they said that there are stress, you know, fractures in some, and there are you know visible cracks in others, uh, but they didn't. You know, there wasn't. They're all intact at the time of restoration, so you know they noted that you know, that they were showing their age, but not that there was any, you know, anything that was really wrong with them. I think one of the plaques had a corner cut off from, a, oh, you know, yeah. from display in town hall, you know, it was near the railing of the stairs. And so that's not from anything other than the way they were displayed at one time. 
So then if, if that's the case, it, it probably would be best just to look at the top one mm -hmm. than to risk mo moving them around to, to see what we can see through photographs for the most part. Right. Mm -hmm. And I just forwarded the commission the email with this report and a few other you know, documents on the tablets just so it's fresh in the email. All right, and then uh, in terms of commission members wanting to attend, you know, I think we could just do a doodle poll then. And you know, if, any, if all of us want to attend, that's fine. And we could just then come up with you know, whether you know, Ben or I have to be there for an hour and work with people to come in in shifts, we can do that. I'm, you know, I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that wouldn't also include uh, Anika and the group that's interested in this? Uh, yes. 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 Yeah, so I guess, Ben, you can, we can uh, email and you can find out how many people that would be and, you know, <laughs> you have two or three people at a time and, you know, have it in some shifts. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, I was really hoping the consultants would. They, last year, we, um, about a year ago, we emailed them and they were, they were very willing to come out. And I think they may have even uh, come out unannounced, but I don't think they realized that where the... <laughs> They came, I think they emailed Brandon at the time. They said, oh, we're here today. And it was like, oh, well, we, we didn't know that. And I think they may have seen the tablets or I'm not, I can't remember if they even got in to see them, but they're, you know, they're, they're regional. So they're, they're willing to come out, which is nice. I'm hoping they're probably in the field a lot now, but I'm hoping they can get back to us. Mm -hmm. um, so question for uh, the commission is whether this first step of going to look at the tablets is is a good first step uh, or whether we want to discuss um, how the commission wants to be involved in uh, sort of organizing how they would eventually be displayed. Could I just ask a question? What is the status of, of Anika's group? Um, versus the historical commission, I think that would would give shed some light on our our role in the process. Uh, I can say that we were able to go and actually visit the proposed outdoor sites, which was definitely motivating. But we are certainly at a point where we would really need to know something about the condition, at least being able to see um, the top plaque and get an idea of what the, the condition for the rest of them would be before we would be able to fully move forward and present uh, with our proposal. That's where we are to be able to know what is basically the condition, how will they, what would they be able to withstand design-wise and um, every other way that we would need to be able to present to any, uh, design team um, or for fundraising or otherwise. Yeah, I think, you know, for the commission, so, you know, we've, staff suggested, you know, outdoor sites for uh, these tablets. And, you know, originally the thought was maybe to go into the expanded library and I'm not sure that's a possibility. The question is, you know, what is a publicly accessible space that people can view these and it, you know, so that's one, you know, what, what is a good space? Is it indoor or outdoor? And then, you know, I think they're better suited to be seen in their entirety, whether it's a series or in one space, but not, you know, have two tablets, say in town hall and then two tablets in the library and spread them out. So, you know, I think, you know, a few of those parameters could be part of the discussion. Maybe they're really not, maybe there's not much of a discussion there, but I think that could help frame it a little bit if we're thinking, okay, there really aren't many buildings they could go in um, then it's outside, what are the locations outside, and then, you know, what are the constraints or guidelines for having them displayed outside in terms of, um, you know, any design considerations, you know, protection from the elements, vandalism, humidity, uh, lighting at night, I mean, things of that nature, but, you know, I'm not sure the library uh, is, you know, would work anymore, so. And Mm -hmm. Again, did I see your hand? Who's, who's hand? 
your hand, Jan? No, it wasn't my hand, but I did want to say I, I would rather see them inside. I think putting them outside and having to put them in some sort of, I don't know, plexiglass or something and worry about vandalism and humidity and marble is not um, a very good stone, you know. Mm -hmm. I think you're asking for trouble putting them outside. Um, I'd love to see them on an, in an interior space with um, air conditioning, you know, humidity control. I know we don't have a space easily found, but it makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, just maybe one, uh, I have a question of clarification about uh, the role of Anika's group. Um, you mentioned uh, that you're at a point now where you need to know about the condition of the tablets in order to uh, start thinking about design options and a design team and fundraising. So um, this is this may be uh, a question for multiple people, uh, including town staff, and that is um, how does a so if the Civil War tablets are if they're the property of the town and a group wants to assist with that project, can the historical commission, to, uh, what functions can the historical commission turn over and what should it retain? That's a good question. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> and I think that was kind of what I was getting at when I, I wanted to know the status of, of Anika's group because how it, how it connects with the um, Amherst Historical Commission and what the various roles are intended to be vis-a-vis -vis the town. Mm -hmm. yeah. So is that some, maybe that's if, uh, um, Anika, perhaps you'd like to comment on it also, but if that's not something any one of us at this moment knows we might need to go back and see if there's any sort of guidelines or um, about that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think, you know, the question of ownership is really interesting and the role of the commission. I mean, you know, I've thought that the commission can be an advocate uh, and work with Anika and her team to, you know, and then, I, yeah, I guess that's something that as this moves forward it, and it progresses, we have to, you know, I can talk to other staff about what is, you know, some of those finer details. You know, I, I guess I haven't, I thought about it, but it hasn't really been, you know, it being asked tonight kind of solidifies that we need to have a, maybe a little more framework to it. Um, yeah. Have we imagined all along that DPW would do the actual moving and installation? I had not imagined. Okay, rather than an outside company. Yeah, just, I mean, possibly they could. My, you know, I'd like to have the conservators weigh in on, you know, what what is the best. Like I said, when speaking with them a while ago, they mentioned a rigging company just because they could have insurance and they have the experience, uh, you know, to get them, you know, they're heavy. So, right. you know. It just changes the budget, that's all. I'm just trying to think of. You know, no, right, right. How we've thought of this. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't, yeah, I mean, moving them around in a forklift just scares me. And so, you know, mm -hmm. my thought is, you know, they have to be really carefully placed and transported. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, we could look into that uh, question in the next month because, I mean, I think we really admire what what you're doing, Anika, and want your group to be as successful as possible because this is a terrific uh, resource and important part of important part of the town's history. So um, why don't uh, we'll, we'll we'll look into that finer point? I think you know, Jan, you said indoors. I mean, I think some of it is you know, kind of brainstorming what could be possible locations. So you know, we you know, there are some nice outdoor ones. You know, for instance, Kendrick Park, you know, the common outside town hall, maybe Sweetser Park. I mean, there's areas that are centrally located that, 
you know, if they're outside and it's in the plaza, it's visible to uh, you know, almost any visitor. And so, you know, are there other in interior locations that could be used? I guess, I guess I'm thinking if you put it in a park or something, I would rather see them say, you know how we had the design to the North Common that had those knee walls? Mm -hmm. I would rather see them embedded in a wall with some sort of plexiglass cover than to have them just hanging on some artificial wall with a case around them or something. I'd like, I'd like to see them more permanently mounted, more securely mounted, and then protected, but not sticking out like some sort of temporary art exhibit or something. It just seems awkward mm -hmm. and, and it, it doesn't really fit into the environment. Whereas if they were part of a wall or part of a divider, or part of something that was already built into the landscape, it would make more sense, you know? I, I just am wondering if, if any thoughts been given to the bank center um, in, in a way that Jan's describing, because that is a town facility and gets a lot of foot traffic, actually. Mm. It would be protected there. I, I just, I, I would have to look at the hallway wall space or the large meeting room wall space or whatever. But anyway, I'm sharing that thought with you. The ideal place would have been that corridor between the library and the historical, um, whatever it's called, museum. Museum. But, yeah, the history museum, but that's no longer in the plan. That just was so ideal. It's hard to think beyond it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I guess we could build, you know, a planter approximately that high and long almost any in any park um, I, I just think it should be incorporated somehow yeah I mean I'd like to think that we could incorporate a landscape design or some something that even if they were even if they were mounted and it was somewhat more of um, you know an art display it, it you know it's then built in around there's a plaza or something built around it so it's it's a cohesive design not you know, let's just a functional plaza, you know what I mean? Yeah. Not just like, here's this thing sticking over off the sidewalk in a corner. Actually, the ones at Amherst College on that staircase, right. you know, on each side, those are part of a structural um, integration into this entire staircase and, you know, mm -hmm. goes up to a quad and everything. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. Even though it, it is its own space, you're right, it would be, you know, some sort of plaza, I guess, yeah. May I ask a question? Yes. Um, I think that we all, whether it's indoors or, or outdoors, would agree that the, you know, however it's, it's um, housed, the design, how it's displayed, should be, you know, as best as it can be and, you know, suit the town and where it is. Um, I'm not sure if Dr. Amelkar Shabazz is on the call now, but um, he, is particularly interested in hearing about, you know, um, indoor options. So I'm wondering if it is possible because I know that there are many other things on the agenda. If we meet as a group to maybe further discuss um, options and ideas, because we have, you know, there may be other um, outdoor or indoor options that we do not know about or haven't thought about and that you all have. Um, to just maybe be on the same page and, you know, for us just to be able to hear and just chat together, share those maybe initial thoughts. Um, it would be nice if there's a, a time that maybe, you know, we can do that or we can devote a little extra time that would be allotted on the agenda. Yes, we'll do that. I think that's a, a good, you know, we should um, devote, devote more time to it in a kind of focused way and come prepared. Yeah, we could make a list and then some things like the library, you know, we could go back and talk about the design of that and where they are and whether it could be modified or something if we had that as one of our top options. Same thing with the North Common. Right. Because I know it was just so inspiring, even just standing on certain, you know, different places and when you can really en envision them up and it's, you know, as you see that, 
there could be, you know, so many places that they, you know, could work. Of course, this is independent of, of design because that really is equally as important. Um, but just there's many places that, you know, they could be seen and visible and, you know, welcoming and, you know, just provide another attraction for the town. Mm -hmm. So can we... Um... Would, our, would there be time on our next agenda for our next meeting? Yeah, I was just making some notes. For instance, we could have some bullets under uh, the tablets. You know, we could have like, you know, locations for display as a sub bullet, you know, design considerations, maybe other parameters. Yes, yeah, so we could have a little more of a detailed discussion outline. Yeah. You know, as you we were talking, I was even thinking like, you know, where, um, you know, along the Amherst Cinema building, you know, there's the, um, it's almost like a covered portico, but for instance, you know, it's like, is there even a space like that that is somewhat covered where they could go and if the town mm -hmm. had an easement or something uh, was, you know, could uh, have an easement there, would that be, you know, uh, a nice space, something like that? I, is yeah, there I, a wall on the West Cemetery that isn't a building that's a separate wall that belongs to the town? Uh, not really, you know, there's just the yeah. fence, the perimeter fence. Yeah. yeah, maybe it could be made into a wall part of it or something. All right. Well, I think we have uh, we have a plan for a visit um, and uh, a plan to continue our uh, conversation in a uh, with a sort of organized uh, bulleted list of items to to discuss. Um, so we'll come back at our next meeting to this topic and hope that um, that you, Nika, and your colleagues can join us. Sounds good. Great. And Anika, look for an email from Ben or myself, and we can try to get. We'll maybe have a doodle poll for everyone just to set up a time. You know, we can block off an hour, an hour and a half for a site visit. All right. Come. Okay. Thank you for yeah. having me. Uh, I will say goodbye. I did notice that you had further down on your agenda uh, something regarding the the West Cemetery. And Nate, I was actually going to call you um, in regards to that. I do have uh, multiple uh, relatives that uh, mm -hmm. is their final resting place. So I'll send just a little uh, my inquiry to yourself and the commission mm -hmm. sometime over the weekend. Great. All right. Yeah, thanks. All right, I look forward to hearing from you soon. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank Bye, you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. So we'll go back up to um, discussion of the demolition uh, bylaw and the workshop. Yeah, well, thanks everyone for going out of order. I thought there was, there was some good points brought up there. I just. So the demolition workshop, I think, you know, I, don't, I thought Chris Skelly gave us a lot of, um, the staff and commission, a lot to consider in terms of what, you know, what do we want out of a demolition bylaw? And so I think I can share the screen. I have, you know, the version that Jane and uh, Robin have worked on. There's the mass historic template. And then there's a version that, you know, Rob Moore, the building commissioner developed last year. So we have three working drafts of a possible demolition bylaw. I think, for me, you know, I almost want to have the commission step back and say, okay, what do we think the purpose of the demolition bylaw is? Chris did that in photos. Is it to stop, you know, the demolition of a building in its entirety or a percentage of it? Or do we care about if people are removing trim? And then from there, you know, it's like, you know, so that to me is, you know, some discussion. And then, you know, the threshold for what even gets, what triggers an application is important you know is it just a an age number and i guess the one other piece that uh really surprised me was that in many communities the decision of if it's a significant and is, is an administrative decision mm -hmm. and so the commission spends a lot of time actually determining if it's significant and so to me that's a huge shift so all of a sudden maybe have a few conditions or guidelines in the bylaw, but then all of a sudden it's, you know, it could just be staff, it could be staff in the chair or a commissioner making that decision seems um, like a big shift. You know, what it does is it puts the commission in a position to really discuss, should it be preserved? And so then that's when the commission could possibly discuss, you know, what, what 
what are the future plans? So for instance, if it's being replicated or the new, a new building is gonna be you know, um, similar, maybe that's okay. That's when the context of the streetscape and surroundings could be discussed. Um, so it's not just, you know, what is its historic you know, character, but also what, are, you know, what are some other factors? I just, but I think that's a pretty big shift, you know, and so mm -hmm. I think in the draft bylaws that have been presented, that wasn't really clear, you know, that we still kept that with the commission. So to me, that's a, a pretty big change. And so I don't know, I mean, if I had other points in my email, but I think there's a lot to consider. I so to think that the, sorry, this is Jane. Yeah, well, so I was going to say, I think w one thing that I've been thinking about since we did that workshop with Chris is I think I like the idea of talking about the points that Nate laid out and then um, kind of going back. What I was thinking is I could go back and using the guidebook plus what we had and um, the other, the Mr. Mora, the building commissioner's draft, see if I can come up with something that would be kind of a new starting point for us. Um, and then we can all kind of go from there just because I think some of it is like, I think it's helpful if we know like what do we want the purpose of the demolition delay bylaws to be and the threshold and the process and then I think that will really determine how we want the bylaw written and that at least gives us a starting point and so I think even though we have all these different drafts we may want to still consider that we kind of almost in a way pretend like we don't have anything so that we can feel free to really make it what we want it to be. And I would vote, uh, I really like the idea of preferably preserved. I would vote that we have a very good template for determining significance, except for a couple that are vague that we always stumble over, right? And if we could tighten those and give those to staff and trust them to apply them, um, and then things come to us at the preferably preserved point, I think that would be a much more interesting and useful point for us to um, get involved. However, I think we're going to have to figure out what is the division between that discussion and what the Design Review Board does. Right now, Design Review Board is only the, what is it, the air, inside business area or something? There's an actual name for that. It's not the BID, but it's... Yeah, there's a Design Review District that covers a fair amount district. of downtown, and then there's a, the area around the town common, so... Right. And you know, all we look at are things like signs and lighting and windows and stuff. I don't think there's, are there any houses within that? We don't look at houses ever. It's no. all business, right? Yeah. So maybe that would be the distinction, Nate, uh, a business versus, well, no, because there's some businesses that the Historical Commission looks at some buildings. Um, but there'd have to be something there or fold them together or something. But then we'd have, we'd be meeting a lot again because we'd be looking at things like whether a sushi place has the right shape S, you know, I mean, Mm -hmm. on their side. The Historical Commission shouldn't be looking at that. But I think it's a really, I really like the idea of throwing it out, using the template from Chris Skelly, and his, also his, um, his set of um, steps to go before the hearing and everything. He had a very clear layout, totally different from what we do. But right. I like it. One one question. I'm sorry. It it just seems that, that on the table is that issue of the two step process, and that's major compared to how this has been done in 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 recent times, and so I think we need to partialize the things that we need to look at and weigh in on. That being one of them. 
Mm -hmm. Also, the question of fines and moratorium on new construction. Fair to the applicant and to the commission and to the public interest also, that kind of right. review step. And if there's doubt, uh, we could err on the side of caution. Um, but it makes sense for the commission to focus on whether the structure should be preferably preserved. But on the question of significance, um, it looks like our criteria for determining significance are uh, maybe a little more detailed than some other. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, the, the criterion about uh, geographic importance is, seems a little bit like an outlier. I think that I looked at the National Register criteria as Chris suggested and um, it's not got geographic importance. It's got, um, I think it's a potential for historic information, something like that, which is also a little, you know, that's going to be a little bit hard to mm -hmm. on. Some of them overlap too, because of those three categories, some of these things overlap, like, like it's a significant location. And then there's the whole thing about geographic but it can be a significant location under historical or under architectural. Remember, you know, some of them are redundant to be simplified a little. Yeah, and I, yeah, I think because they're redundant, it can be confusing. So if we simplify it uh, for determining significance, then that I think helps to clean up the, the two-step process that where there's administrative review on one end with that set of criteria and then a discussion mm -hmm. preservation with a and we could ask that when it comes to us with the designation significant we could ask what the criteria were that they applied mm -hmm. right? yeah. mm -hmm. i guess if something didn't we'd never know so we wouldn't get like things that didn't pass that and why would we well, I mean, you know, the local historic district commission was supposed to happen at, you know, a monthly meeting or some meeting is that staff would report on what applications came in and what uh, was excluded from review. So the idea could be, you know, an agenda item might be every other month is a report on demolition applications and, you know, that didn't make it to the hearing process or to the commission review. Mm -hmm. One thing I thought um, in, if we wanted if we were going to do the two-step process where we we had someone we had staff determine or like staff and the chair determine significant structure and then um and then the it not come to the historic commission is if we created like because we'd have a list of what significant structure means we almost have like a checklist that goes with it and so after like as it gets reviewed by staff and the chair of the historic commission, if they basically check the boxes and then when it gets presented to us as like, this did not come to us because of these, then we have, we have it in writing what boxes it checked versus what it didn't. So that there's like an actual physical checklist. I think that goes back to the, when we were talking with Chris about the transparency, if we were gonna have the two-step mm -hmm. process. The first step had to have a lot of clarity mm -hmm. to either move to the historical commission or recommend that it doesn't. Um, so, so Jane, I think that that the clarity begins there. Yeah, I mean, my thought is if once if it's found significant, then it automatically goes to a demolition hearing. So there's no. What's nice about that process is there's no. Um, there's no question about it. So then the commission can really, like Jan said, focus on should it be preserved? And if we have some guidelines in the bylaw, then the applicant and the commission know, they know what the conversation will be centered around in terms of mm -hmm. what they're looking for. So I guess, you know, backing up a little bit, I, I, I think the two-step process can work. I guess I'm still, I'd still like to know if what the commission members feel about First of all, what's the, the threshold for applying for a demolition permit and what is considered demolition? So, you know, if, if it's an age-based bylaw, which Chris Kelly was 
um, mm -hmm. kind of directing everyone to, you know, what is the mechanism to, you know, 50 years is a moving target. So in 20 years, it's going to be a newer date. So does, is a 50 year, do we just say 50 years and we're pretty solid on that and any exceptions are there, you know, if there's some building we, we really think would we try to inventory those and actually specifically name them by address or location in the bylaw, which seems somewhat odd. Um, and then everything else just wouldn't even, you know, it wouldn't come, it'd be really clear. And then, you know, and then what is demolition? So, you know, later on in the agenda, there's, you know, this house on 330 Pine Street, right? That's taking down what is part of a, an attached shed and, you know, for instance, like would something like that uh, pass the new definition? Is it taking down enough of the structure? Does the commission want to see something like that? So I feel like that's a pretty big question. I mean, you know, because we'll have someone now come in if the building's over 50 years and they might be taking out some windows, we, we might tell them to, you know, submit a demolition application. And there hasn't been clear guidelines on what exactly is triggers that, that application. I would like to go over to the percentage. Uh, we talked about this a lot uh, a few years ago. And I think percentage is going to be a stronger control than something like deciding it's only the roof, the walls, the this, the that. Because if you take enough trim off, you've completely changed the look of a building. So if we say 25% of what's visible from the street, I mean, I went by 330 Pine Street today, you can barely see that portion of the house behind. Um, it certainly isn't part of the street view. Mm -hmm. So that wouldn't really come even into consideration. But if we set these um, exact amounts, like 25% and 50 years and that kind of thing, then it's pretty straightforward for staff, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say also that the, um, the draft that Jane and uh, Robin have been working on have, have a useful uh, section in there about exemptions. Mm -hmm. uh, and also I think we could uh, sort of enhance the definition of significant alteration. And I think those two things working um, could be useful in, in the clarity of the, of, um, the, the first intake and what happens with an application. Mm -hmm. I can um, do a new share and see if I can pull it up. We were saying in uh, documents floating around here, but yeah. So, yeah, if um, it'd be like a combination of section 13.30, mm -hmm. um, where instead of demolition of the entire structure, that right. could be a percentage or qualified in other ways. And mm -hmm. then down here under exemptions, right. th that gets to be pretty specific. Mm -hmm. Right, but that, right, so I mean, that's interesting. Um, we have that from the local historic district, but right, so that way if someone is coming in and they're saying this is what we'll do, then we know that it doesn't need a demolition hearing. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it, it you know, I, you know, yeah, my only, yeah, I guess my only caution is uh, what happens with the local historic district, you know, someone will say that and then we'll ask them for plans or drawings and the drawings or plans never really indicate that it'll be a one for one match if there's a lot of detail. Mm -hmm. So there's an application now where there's, you know, some, probably some, uh, you know, there's turn columns with some decorative trim above it. And, you know, first they're saying, oh, well, we'll, re we'll replace the columns. And now they're like, oh, well, we're just going to take them down and put new ones in. And so what originally was, well, we'll match them or we'll make them similar is really, they're just going to replace them with probably, you know, pressure treated, right. Mm -hmm. And cover, you know, and wrap the pressure treated in, in pine and painted or something. So it's, you know, I don't know. I feel like if we, if someone applies for this and says, okay, we're going to replace our windows with something similar, 
you know, it'll be, uh, it'll be on staff, but we'd almost need to see the cut sheets or the building permit application to verify it because easy enough to get a demolition permit and then they apply for the building permit and it doesn't happen. But, I mean, I do like this. This, 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 to me, this, these exemptions are clear. It's just. We have in the past spent a lot of meetings discussing what was going to be replaced and exactly how it would look. Mm -hmm. And then going back to whether or not we've granted demolition and obviously we have to then keep saying, but this isn't our purview. Right. If we do pres preferably preserved, it would be, and it would make sense for people to show us what they're going to put there, right. which is what they want to do when they come to the meeting. That's how they justify demolition. So it, it all fits together better. And I would like to know if somebody has two gorgeous Doric columns and they say, we'll replace them just looking like that. And then they go buy some plastic thing that's online, you know, that looks classical or something. I would like to know that that wasn't accurately replaced, you know? So I think having that detail would be useful. I'm not saying, I'm saying it would be, I just, I guess there's a little bit more follow up with staff to make sure it happened. So, you know, just, yeah. You mean, you're saying that they apply for demolition permit and if they, and then they don't do the building permit until they've got a decision on that, is that the problem? Well, for instance, like replacement of windows, right? Someone could, co could come in and say, we're gonna meet this exemption in the bylaw. But then when they actually go to apply for the building permit, which say is a, few, a month or two later, they're not going to do that. They're gonna do something else. And so there has to, you know, staff is good about following through with what's being done. But, you know, I think once something is exempt, there has to be some careful follow through with staff to make sure what, why it's exempt is, is um, they, you know, they meet with what, what they say they're going to do. So, you know, I could see a lot of contractors or people coming in saying, oh, we're going to fall, we're going to fall in an exemption because we're going to replace it as it is. And well, then, maybe it should say right here in the document, exemptions uh, must be a company, requests for exemptions must be accompanied by detailed building. Plans. Yeah, maybe, right. Maybe it should say something like that. Is there I, I, do kind of, like the, I do like them. I think it's really clear. Yeah. Is there any kind of an other sort of administrative step, Nate, that would link um, the decision of the Historical Commission with the building permit and inspections? Or is that just, that's just multiple layers of extra work for staff? Um, when, uh, yeah, when, when someone applies for a demolition permit or a demolition application now, it's actually, there's two fees. One's the historical commission fee and one's the building department fee. So it actually serves as kind of the building permit for demolition. And so uh, my thought actually is if we write it this way, it would be a separate, totally separate application that, um, is a separate permit that's issued. So I think the, the, the problem now is that because it's in the zoning bylaw and it's structured this way, the historical commission decision actually isn't a permittable action. It's just almost a recommendation to issue the building permit. But if this becomes something that's in the general bylaw, it, even possibly in the zoning bylaw, we could have it be that the commission's decision gets someone a permit. And I don't mind it. Being, I don't mind it being layered, but that that to me that's cleaner because then once they get the historical commission's permit, whether that's you know whether whether it's a delay or not, then if you know if they get allow demolition, they they can go to a building permit. If they have a delay after twelve months, they bring that to the building department, and then they get a building permit as opposed to saying, oh, you know, I have this demolition application, which is also secondarily serving as my building permit for demolition. It's yeah. Um, one question I have is, so it sounded like from what Chris said that he recommended we get it out of the, out of the zoning bylaws and into the general bylaws. How difficult is that to do? I don't think it's difficult. I think, you know, the, it's interesting. I, you know, the, the town, one of the town attorneys, Joel Bard at, at KP Law, he's actually, uh, 
really experienced in demolition bylaws. And so the town manager at one recommended we even ask Joel what he thinks in terms of uh, the details of a bylaw. Mm -hmm. So Joel had said a while ago, he thought the move to a general bylaw was both because you can write in an appeal process and because it then becomes um, something that becomes its own action. You know, right now under zoning, it's, it's a land, it, we're saying it's a land use regulation, which really isn't accurate. It, so that's why I thought communities were moving into the general bylaw. Chris said it's moving to the general bylaw because it's only a majority vote of a legislative body to get it adopted as opposed to a two thirds major, a majority, super majority in town meeting. So, you know, for instance, anytime we needed to change it, it's a super majority if it's in the zoning. But to me in Amherst, that's not, it, to me, that's not a compelling reason. I think the reason we'd want to move it to general bylaw is because it's really not a zoning issue in that respect. And, you know, it's, um, you know, for instance, Chris Skelly said nowhere else and has he seen in a demolition bylaw the reference to 40A. So in our demolition bylaw right now, we reference 40A and he's like, it's not a 40A issue. So I think it's just cleaner if it's in the general bylaws and, you know, we could write in an appeal process, you know, so the first appeal is to um, a mediator, the first appeal may be to court or something, but as, because it's a zoning bylaw, the decision can't even be appealed until the building permit's issued. And then the building permit itself is appealed to the zoning board of appeals, which is just a really mm -hmm. odd way to try to mediate a demolition process. So I think it just works better in the general bylaw, you know, functionally and legally. But the two thirds- I have been planning to do that all along. And isn't it this going to be a basically the same process, Nate, whether we put a whole, bring a whole new thing forward and say replace what we have or bring a whole new thing forward and say, this is going to go in a new place. I mean, it's, just, it's going to take about the same amount of work, right? I agree. Yeah. I, my thought is we have a whole new bylaw and we say without crossing out the zoning bylaw, remove this section and we're going to put it in the general bylaw and it's, you know, it can be one, the same vote. Yeah. I, I think we've been planning pretty much to do that all the way. No, I agree. Yeah. Good. This may be a minor point, but um, I think I think we need to uh, change the title of, of the bylaw. So it's not about demolition delay, it's about preservation. I agree. Yeah. Uh, did, did we talk about that with him? I thought, I thought where was it? Uh, oh, I know the, um, the, the, the demolition, the Massachusetts demolition thing that he gave right. uh, has a better name, doesn't it? I think that was the yeah, one. I think I think that's right. Yeah. I forget what it was called now, but yes, I thought it was much better. Oh, I had it open. Yeah, I am um, not seeing it right now, actually. I can add it. I'm not either. Um, so preservation commission application. Oh, this is for demolition certificate. Wait, that was a better name. Oh, well, I'll find it. I had made notes. Um, Jane, uh, I made some kind of detailed comments on the draft that you and Robin have been working on. Would you like me to send that back to you? Absolutely. Okay. I will take any comments. Yeah, the title that is in that draft, that Massachusetts um, whatever you call it, template, is the preservation of historically significant buildings. And it seems to me we could just name, name it something like that. Bylaw for the preservation of historically significant buildings. Yeah, so I think one thing um, for everyone to know, I don't know if Ben's announced it, but he, he has time and is willing to help, you know, work through the bylaw drafts, Jane, if you need <coughs> some help. So I, um, so I think any comments that are sent around, you can copy Ben and myself on those, and then we can uh, work on those as well. Yep. And yeah. Please do. That sounds great. I do. I mean, I do like the idea of having the commission focus on whether something should be preserved. I do think that's when people come to the commission. I think they're always surprised that the commission isn't supposed to talk about future plans, and you know, really isn't is only supposed to look at the historical 
quality and you know nature of the building, which is part of it, but it's difficult to say, well, what, you know, depending on what's changing, it's, you know, it, the, the demolition may be okay, but you can't, we're not even, the commission's not even supposed to say that right now. Right. Yeah. That's, that is kind of hobbling, I think. It is. Yeah. So we like, you. everyone seems to um, like, uh, I mean, aspects of every, every one. So Dane Scheffler, to your point, maybe you and Ben could work together on at least getting an outline for a new or um, a new bylaw, mm -hmm. you know, pulling in parts from the different ones we've mentioned. So, you know, for instance, we have our exemptions from the bylaw, the commission draft, which seems to be a nice set of exemptions that may not be in the mass historic the same way. So then we could, you know, at least get a, a table, you know, a table of contents or an outline for what, what we like in the bylaw. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was just going to add one thing that occurred to me today. I, I was doing some research about, um, you know, what the building commissioner had proposed, what the um, commissioners proposed, and then comparing that with the Mass Historic Bylaw. And I actually, I looked at Northampton and Greenfield's bylaws as well. And one thing I noticed, too, is, um, like, we're calling it a two-step process, but I think even ours right now, technically, I would almost call it a three-step process in that like um the building permit when it's like first sent to the building commissioner there's kind of that initial filtering step where you know if it's 50 years or older then it's sent to the commission or you know in some cases a, a staff person to determine significance and then it's sent to the commission to determine whether it should be preserved. So that was just one thing that I noticed today was that there is kind of that even fir first initial filtering step where it's like, you know, 50 years or older, boom, it's going to go on this pathway as opposed to just, you know, issuing the permit. Um, so that was just one thing I noticed. Um, but yeah, I, I have time. Um, I, uh, Chris Restrup, the planning director, kind of asked me to, you know, take a look at this. I'm going to be helping with some other zoning bylaw updates um, for some for other things in town. So um, I can kind of add this to um, my workload, and I'm happy to kind of meet meet with folks and do some of the legwork here. So feel free to keep me in the loop. I also liked some other things in the mass historic model. Um, uh, fines and moratorium on new construction and also um, what was the other one the, well neglect we've added neglect and I think we should be tougher on that the minimum maintenance bylaw that affirmative maintenance bylaw I thought that's we don't have anything like that I think we should add that in um, also longer delays and higher fines consider those I think we should discuss those again um, you know Chris um, was saying that this isn't a good time to have longer delays because the current climate, it's problematic for economic development, but um, Chris Skelly said no, it allows jobs and we should see economic historic resources as a driver instead of a um, deterrent. And for that reason, I had thought we should talk to the um, council, the town council, before we bring this, a few months before we bring this, we should do a presentation to them on why we save old buildings, why we preserve things, and how those are good things for a community, not economic problems for a community, not drawbacks. Um, you know, he, he mentioned the, the four E's, um, and so I started playing with that, putting together a, a, a possible um, presentation. He did environmental, economic, educational, and emotional. Um, and I, I think we could do something for them that would be kind of upbeat, not terribly defensive, although that's obviously the point since, was it, who said, um, who was the woman who was the person from the public last time? What's her name? Hedda? Helga? What's her name? Oh, Hilda. Hilda. Yeah, she said that they're against us and want to, um, get rid of both our commission and the design review board because uh, they think that we're holding back the town. Um, so I think we need to go in there and explain how good it is that we exist 
and how what a positive thing it is for a town like Amherst to have us, and then a few months later bring this forward. I think we might need an extra step in there. Um, so for, uh, first of all, I, I kind of wonder about Chris Skelly's comment that it's an economic driver, uh, because it seems to me he's talking about communities that are more densely built and more densely residential and have greater opportunity for rehabilitation of historic structures than, than our area does. But uh, leaving that aside, I'd also, I also think that, um, it, that two of the members of the town council have expressed interest in this bylaw. And um, as long as we are continuing to work on it, we, you know, we may want to you know, run some things past them in order to kind of, you know, at least engage part of the council in the, in, in our thought process and in what we're doing so that there is a, a greater understanding of what the historical commission's role is even before we make a, a presentation, which I think is a, a good idea, but I'm, I think I'm wondering if we need an extra step I mean, I always, I always think in terms of Concord versus us, you know, and you may think, you may see Concord as more, what you were saying, densely um, residential and, I don't know, having more historic things, but it seems to me that we're really lucky to have Amherst College because they've preserved so many buildings in the downtown area that we probably wouldn't have been able to save otherwise. And so we're kind of unique as a town that way. And if we just try and keep that up, if the town and you know and the other residents keep it up to go with Amherst College's look, we have a really attractive historical town. If we let that go, they just become the anomaly of the college, and the college is the attraction, not the town. You know, um, so I think it can be an economic driver. People come to visit, well, the Dickinson House and other places, and if they want to see other historical sites here, and there are plenty, as we know from the Writers' Walk beyond the college, then we are economically increasing tourism and overnight stays and all that stuff. So it can be a driver and, you know, it does provide by a certain amount of jobs. So, I don't know. You know, I mean, Jane, when you said that, I was thinking um, possibly have a presentation to both the um, uh, CPA com uh, committee and town council about, you know, historic mm -hmm. commission in general. So you know, what, what, you know, what are, what does a historical commission do in general? What, you know, what's its role in town? And then, you know, there's different pieces. So it'd be an educational um, meeting. And then, you know, we could talk about if there's a few specific topics. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff on the online, things like this, you know, six, you can't read this, six practical reasons to save old buildings. There's a lot of this stuff out there. And they, it, it gives a lot of really good, um, simple you know reasons that i think a lot of these people haven't thought about they mm -hmm. just you don't think in these ways um so and then uh, I guess, i'd be happy to pull, pull, help pull one together i mean i think before that i do like i like the idea of trying to get a um a template down for the demolition bylaw and then maybe to jane near point you know having staff and counselors discuss it you know so what you know that you know, we've talked about moving it from zoning to the general bylaw, and maybe maybe that's not known to a lot of people. So then, you know, just for instance, getting that out there, and then, um, you know, if we have a few clear um, parts of the bylaw, you know, for instance, you know, what are the thresholds for application? We're changing the significant, who determines significance? We're, we're adding this preferably preserved. We have different definitions. Um, we have exemptions. I mean, I feel like we could get a few working pieces together of a bylaw that, you know, then staff could look at or bring to, you know, a, the, you know, Mandy Joe was willing to um, look at those, you know, and we could, uh, I could ask the town manager's office if they think that's worthwhile to have, you know, this kind of these meetings. But I think, I feel like we have a number of pieces of the bylaw I'd like to just work on a little bit more and see where the commission, um, what the commission thinks of that. I'd be cautious about, um publicly broadcasting too much that we want to move it out of the zoning bylaw too soon because I could see that backfiring on us. 
Mm -hmm. And people saying, oh, well, if it isn't part of zoning, and it just becomes, you know, its own thing, who, who are these people and why should they have this kind of control? You know, I think if it's tied to zoning right now, they're, they're feeling like it's less touchable. I don't know if that's true, but, right. you know. I wonder if, um, Pat, Patty, or Jane, you have some thoughts on this part of the discussion? I'm thinking number one, to change the title of the bylaw to the preservation. Jan said it nicely before, because when we start out with demolition, it, it, it isn't the purpose of our commission. Our commission is to um, support preservation. And so that alone, but I, I think that we've got some more work to do on the bylaw. I, I would need to learn more about the nuance of the zoning board and the connection with the historical commission to understand what Jan just said, that, that by moving, moving the parts could be um, threatening. And we need to think that really carefully through before we'd make any recommendations. But I think if we, if we work on the bylaws and, and have clarity about the role of the Commission for Preservation, um, the demolition except, exceptions, I, I like exemptions. I like that, that's new. And I like that in our bylaws. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we need to do a little more work on the bylaws before we um, engage in, in the conversation. I, and, and maybe you don't agree with that, but I think that, that we kind of need to have more clarity with the what we're trying to do for clarity before we start discussing it and so. maybe what some of what you're talking about could be in an introduction to the bylaw yes yes and and because that, that's a preamble to to get people is mindset into the right place mm -hmm. i i also think it would help if, if our title was preservation rather than demolition. I think it it's, it sets a different um, bar line or um, baseline or something in terms of how people react possibly. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure. I, I feel like I'm still really learning the ins and outs of all of this. So thank you, Jane, for asking, but I think that's about as much as I can comment on at this point. Yeah, and I think, I still, I, you know, um, so Jan, maybe you mentioned penalties. I mean, I've also thought that, you know, I think at the end of this bylaw, there were some um, sections that weren't complete about, you know, when would a permit expire? When, um, you know, can it be transferred to another owner? I mean, I think there are little pieces that, there are details that we can end up working out, but at least if we have a, a topical, uh, headline for those, you know, and they could fall under. So, you know, sometimes we have owners who apply for a demolition permit thinking they're going to move soon or change the property, and then the new owner inherits something that's been granted. And so, you know, the commission could write in, for instance, that, you know, the if a new owner takes takes um, there's new ownership during the delay that they have to reapply or something, so that it's not you know where people aren't trying to game the system, or that you know we've had owners apply for demolition and three years later they come back to the commission and say, oh, I, I don't have to apply again. It, I, you know, three years ago, you said yes. And it's like, well, I think we should say that if they don't act on it within six months, they have to reapply or something. So there's ways to, you know, even on kind of the back end of it, tighten it up a little bit. And it looks like Jane and Jan have been, um, oh man. They, they've been lost. I mean, our, Hilda was on it too when she's not here. So I don't know if there's power outages. I know there's some severe storms coming through the area. Yeah, so you know, a lot of thunder was, in line where I am. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm in South Amherst and our power just kind of flickered. And then I think our, at least one of our Google boxes rebooted itself. So. Oh, yeah, I think. Yeah. So, I, Ben, thank you for volunteering the. Um, Jane, I, I think you and Ben, and you know, you can copy me too. I think getting, you know, working on a new draft that everyone can look at is would be helpful. I think there's a yeah. lot of pieces here. It's just a matter of pulling them all together. 
Yeah, I was going to say, Jane, I'm, I'm like very much a visual learner. And sometimes I just get so lost in these blocks of text. And so I, um, I made like, like this series of flow charts, which kind of shows like each step um, and like different arrows for like where they go and exemptions here and there. So that was really helpful for me as like a, even just a uh, learning tool just to go through that process. And I'd be happy to kind of share those um, flow charts for as like a starting point as well. Sure. Yeah. Send it over. I just like, especially after, so basically at least like from just if it's helpful, I took what Robin had been working on with Ted. I think that's who it was. And I, she, they'd done a fair amount of work with some of what I did was just like the definition section. I just tried to make it look easier to read yeah. Um, and then I think, especially once we found out that we were going to have the ability to have Chris come in and give us a tutorial on like the best practices for this. So I am not going to, like, there is no way that I will be offended if we just like dump all of this and start over again, or if we only yeah. take a couple pieces of it, because what is most important to me is that we come up with something that is clear and concise as much as it can be but also just really does what we need it to do mm -hmm. um and so I think like that's I guess that's probably not not I don't know I just want to make sure that people know that like I don't send me whatever feedback you have you will not hurt my ego I just want this to be good <laughs> for the town yeah, exactly <laughs> And I'm, I love the idea of renaming it to the bylaw for the preservation of historically significant buildings. I think that's, I feel like when you call it just like a demo, demo, delish, demo, demo, demolition delay bylaw, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't encapsulate what we're trying to do, which is preserve historically significant structures. Um, and I feel like it just makes it sound like something that people don't want to have to deal with. So like, I feel like if you go to a building owner and they're like, oh, hold on, you have this delay because of demolition, they're gonna be like, uh-uh. Whereas no if way. we're like, no, we want to preserve this structure. It's like, oh, okay, maybe I can get on board with that. Right. You're back. Nate, uh, uh, I lost power for a while and Jane has lost power and she's off in Wald. Yeah. Um, we may have to delay this meeting while this storm is going on because I have what I'm being told my internet is iffy and she can't get back. I get the iffy stuff all the time. Zoom does not like my, <laughs> my, my, no, the, my <laughs> internet is saying to me that the power is coming and going because down here in South Amherst we lose our power every couple of weeks so Every yeah, it's pretty dark here right now. The um, yeah, we have a quorum. I guess you know. I think we've wrapped up the demolition discussion. I think you know Ben and Jane and Robin will work on a draft that tries to um, you know, merge some of the various uh, versions we have and come up with at least a working template we can then discuss. Okay. Well, let's then um, look at maybe another date for the three thirty pine, the cellular tower. Public comment and um, West Cemetery, U campus, UMass campus pond. That's a lot. And if we're coming and going, like she, she just texted, she can't get back. I, it took me a few minutes to get things back up. And okay. anybody else could go out at any minute too. Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, you know, what one that's more time sensitive than the other is uh, 330 Pine Street. So let me just, um, See, Hilda just rejoined us, so she maybe Jane can get back on in a minute. Um, yeah, they're both on the north end. Um, did okay. everybody go to 3, 330 Pine Street, or have we looked at it carefully? Because we could just do a quick vote. Yeah, I think it might just be that that's, I'm trying to minimize, uh, reduce my PDF size. So yeah, the, in the interior photos to me were not, as explanatory as the owners thought they were. <laughs> no, no, I agree. You know, I would only. Um... What the giant blur didn't show you what you were trying to see? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, why would you even include that? <laughs> you know, it is balloon framed, sure. You know, I think the exterior, yeah, I don't know if there's so many pictures, you know, 
it's the back section here. Right. And you know, the owner is saying that it was built, it's not 50 years old. Um, on old aerial photographs, the roof, you can see the roof's older. So this area was, you know, maybe not uh, constructed at the same time as the main house, but there is part of it that is older and maybe, maybe it was rebuilt or maybe it had been an open air shed that they enclosed in the 60s. Uh, the house, I forget, because it couldn't have been the summer kitchen if it's a 19th century house. I forget when it was built. Yeah, they say it was um, yeah, 115 years old, the house. Right, yeah. Well, I, I don't know, I went by there today and unless you're coming from the east and looking down um, the side of the house at the angle, like that first view you showed, right. you don't hardly notice it and I don't think it's gonna affect the look of the property at all. So I wouldn't have any problem with it. I think that's just, everybody else can weigh in how they feel. Actually, when you look at the roof line, there seems to be some some separation toward the front of the house. Um, and so you wonder, you wonder how much of the shed was there to begin with and, and how much the roof line was extended. But I agree with you, Jan. I took a drive by and it, it, it doesn't seem significant to the house or to the street view or to history. Even if it was a separate building and it was later attached with that in-between section, mm -hmm. it's not a significant architectural item on the property to me. No, I, I agree with that. It, 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 um, it ceased to be useful and it doesn't appear to have significance. And it kind of an eyesore. Yes. I mean, you can't see it from the street, but I mean, if you're, I'm looking at the pictures and it's like the, I think it's supposed to be brick, but it looks like someone took like a sticker of brick and just slapped it on the side of the house. Oh, that's that. That's a type of asphalt yeah. siding. It's asphalt. It's okay, asphalt like, siding. It's very common. Like, it looks like it's peeling off in some it places. Is. And so it's yeah. like, I feel like they'd probably be doing the house a favor by getting rid of it. Well, the siding can be changed, but yeah. Yeah, the, um, in one of the aerial photographs, the roof color here was different. So it was really odd. Um, at some point, maybe they patched it over with the, this type of roof, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's really difficult to, to determine when this was built uh, more accurately than what the owner has, um, has indicated. So does the commission want to make a vote to allow demolition or not have a hearing? Is there any? I have to run the meeting now. So somebody else make a motion. I make a motion that we um, allow demolition. And I second it. That's Hetty. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? Any, I guess we should have asked if there was public comment before we did this motion. Um, uh, you have with their hand up, Nate? I don't see any hands being raised right now. Okay, great. Well then uh, I'll call a roll call vote. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pat? Uh, I uh, approve. Yes, I agree. Okay, Jane Shuffler? Agreed. Patty? Agreed. And I agree. And that's enough of a quorum? Yeah, that's a quorum. Okay. Is um, maybe Jane called in? I'm, yeah, I'm, uh, mm -hmm. I'm texting with her. I can ask her if she wants to vote. <laughs> That was Jane. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm on oh, the Oh, there you are. Good. Yay. So we, we just looked at the Pine Street demolition application and there was a vote to allow demolition. Uh, um, is this a hearing? No. This it is was, not a hearing. It isn't. No, it's, it's a decision to not require a hearing. Okay, then uh, I, I vote to not require a hearing. Right. Okay. And Janet suggested maybe having another meeting time uh, just because of the weather and possible conditions of not having um, continuous, you know, Zoom, Zoom, a Zoom attendance. I don't know what you, how you feel about that or. 
see. Is there any? There's nothing else that is the 132 Northampton Road project. That's not terribly timed. Oh, there is a meeting on August 6th. Yeah, I think um, the CBA will probably meet into September on that one. So if okay. we don't want to discuss it tonight, um, and I guess one other one, if everyone can see my screen, you know, there was the cell tower uh, notice yeah. for, you know, on the corner of um, West Pomeroy and 116. So behind the, the Valley of Transporter. Yeah, right. yeah. And I don't, you know, hmm. I think they contacted Mass Historic. Um, just as the shippo, but then you know this was sent to the town asking, uh, you know, is there any impact to historic resources if a, a ninety foot tower is put there? You know, my only thought is there's a few old homes on West Pomeroy. Uh, I you know I I don't you know I, I can't say that there's a large impact, but I'm not sure if the commission has any questions or. Well, I was going to go down 116 just to see if there was anything just north of that um, strip mall or anything that looked historic as well. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have a chance. I think if it's not, yeah, if it's not time sensitive, then I, I think we should move it to the next meeting. All right, yeah, I mean, I can't tell that they have any, I mean, we'd appreciate comments as soon as possible within the next 30 days. And that was sent on July 6th. So, um. okay. Does anybody feel that we have enough information to comment at this time and meet that 30 day requirement? I mean, I myself don't feel that I have. I don't know either. Does it have to be a public meeting or can we just send in comments by email and compile them? I think we could. It could uh boy that's a good question it's not, it's not a demolition uh, it's just they're asking what we if we think there's yeah. anything right i mean right yeah yeah all right so what we could do is authorize uh the is ask the staff to collect comment and convey mm -hmm. those comments to to um the correspondent I yeah, will say that, you know, north of this is Amherst Office Park, so there's some older buildings. You know, there was a discussion with staff to ask the owners if they'd be willing to push the, uh, the tower further north of the corner of the property just so that, you know, if, you know, or at least ask the owner's representatives, is there, you know, the ability to move the location of the tower in the back of the property? So if there, you know, if there is an impact or if it makes more sense to put it north because, uh, you know, it's out of view more or something. And I don't know if that's the case, but we were, someone was gonna follow up with the owners about that. Okay, go look. Okay. Could we well, meet in like two weeks? We could, yeah, I'm not. Finish this and pick up anything else that has come up by then. Mm -hmm. So how do people feel about meeting in two weeks? I kind of, let's see, I think. That would be the fifth. And then, well, let's. Uh, I'm, away. I'm away that week, so just FYI. Um, we would also plan to have our regular monthly meeting, presumably, mm -hmm. which would fall on the 19th. And if this cell tower item is the only item that is quite that time sensitive, um, can we can we send oh. comment to town staff and ask them to convey them to the to the correspondent. Wouldn't 132 Northampton Road need to be done? Oh, you said into September. I guess that could be at the next monthly meeting. Yeah, no, I think if we, if the commission met on the 19th, the, um, I think the ZBA might, you know, is gonna hear, they'll hear, they'll hear it on August 6th, and then maybe the week of the 19th, maybe the, maybe even on the 20th, and then they're gonna have a hearing or two in September, maybe even October, so we have time. <laughs> I just, I just keep thinking of how much there is for every meeting. We still have West Cemetery signs. 
campus pond and we want to look we want to spend a lot of time on the civil war signs we need a lot of time to look at the bylaw it feels like we almost need more meetings for a little while until we get through some of this i i just need to say that i'm not going to be available on the 19th but i'm available any other wednesday in august Okay. So maybe we should plan to meet on the 5th and the 19th? Well, Hetty won't be here on the 5th. I won't be here on the 19th, but that's what fine. What about the 12th? Is everybody around on the 12th? Yeah, the 12th works for me. Yes. Yeah, I don't think I'm going anywhere. Yes, it works for me too. So maybe that instead of the 19th, and um, if we don't think we need, and that gives us actually more time ahead, and then we maybe could plan one two weeks later or something to, if we need it to finish up some of these things like the Civil War tablets or the bylaws. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, and then the next one maybe would be two, if we met two weeks later, it would be September uh, 2nd, but you know, right, so maybe we'd have. No, it would be the 26th. From the 12th. Oh, sorry, the 26th, yeah. <laughs> Which is better because the second is. Well, right. Yeah. No, yeah. it's not Labor Day weekend. I was thinking it was, was going to be part of that. Not that that matters these days. Well. Yeah, I mean, I think the 12th would work, and then we can see how much we get done, and if we need to meet again in this, you know, I, I agree. I think the. You know, I'm not sure how far along the tablets will be, but that is a big discussion, and then the bylaws a pretty big discussion, and we we can only do it at a public meeting, so there's not, you know, kind of just, it's hard to move through. So if we're talking about three meetings in August, then uh, I would request that as the agenda is um, prepared, that not all of these items be on every agenda. It's only two meetings. So two meetings. Okay. 12th and 26. Yeah. Okay, so um, we'll say the 12th. Are we saying so on the, on the 5th, 5th, let's have the cell tower? No. And no, no meeting on the 5th. The, instead, it's the 12th. Oh, I thought we were talking about the 12th. So I thought you were talking about a meeting on the 5th, a meeting on the 12th, and a meeting on the 26th, instead of a meeting on the 5th, a meeting on the 19th, and a meeting on the 26th. No, um, because there weren't going to be people here, both the 5th and 19th, we changed both of those okay. to one on the 12th. Okay, all right. And then did we, I thought it was fine if um, individual members emailed staff with comments about the cell tower. Yes, yeah. and that could come off the agenda. agenda. So then why are, okay, never mind. And then are we talking 6 p.m. or back to 5 p.m.? I think, I know 5 p.m. doesn't work for some members, so 6, I mean, if, if 6 works. It's fine with me. And then on the 12th, could we, I agree, if we have so many items that it's, the meeting seems overwhelming, would, you know, would that be a good chance just to talk about the demolition bylaw some more and have that be a main agenda item? Can we have a draft of some things by then, Hetty and Ben? Or no, Jane and Ben? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I could work towards that. Great. And maybe, so it'd be demolition by law and maybe 132 Northampton Road. Just, you know, the so just for 132 Northampton Road, you know, Valley CDC is proposing affordable housing there and they want to take down the house. So they want to, you know, Mm -hmm. But as part of the comprehensive permit application, the demo, there is no demolition application. They're asking that be waived and the ZBA is reviewing it. So, you know, I think we could, we could touch on it on the um, 12th and see what the commission thinks. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, so maybe, we, maybe we could try to do our site visit before the 26th for the Civil War tablets. So we kind of have that yep. done and then we can talk, discuss it by the 26th. That's yeah. good. Oh. Yeah. So I just, for note taking purposes, I just want to make sure we're on the, our next meeting on the 12th, we're going to continue discussion of 132 Northampton Road and demolition delay bylaws, correct? Sure. Preservation bylaw. Okay, we should. Right. <laughs> we have to start training ourselves. <laughs> That's the first thing we should do. 
I'm putting it in right now. I mean, I'm actually like writing it in the minutes as preservation of historically significant buildings by law. Great. Okay. I am getting pounded here. I have to go close up the chicken coop and save the, the chicks or they're going to drown. So I got to go run so out. Is there, a is there a motion to adjourn? I so move. I second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you all very much. I hope you survive the flood. Thanks, Jane. Take care. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.